Good afternoon, everybody. This is my first year at Rewire, and I'm <coughs> glad to be here with you. And you know, we've got we lost probably about five minutes and since I intend to cover a whole book of the Bible. We're going to see how much the Holy Spirit's going to help me right now. Uh -oh. <laughs> this I will tell you. I'm not really going to try to give you a hard Bible lesson today. I want to give you something like from here to here. Um, a lot of the decisions that you'll make in your future that will uh, move your life the fastest, um, they may work up here, but it's when you have made a decision down in here and you never go to the left or to the right of that decision for a long time. I have a complete conviction that every single person in this room is called by God. Amen. I don't think that there is one person in this room that is not just as chosen as Peter, James, John, Paul, Moses, Abraham, not one. I believe that the same God that knew Elijah, Elisha, Samson, Samuel, David, Saul, knew your name just as well. Amen. I don't think he had a list of names up here, and then he said, I'll make some second-rate folks here, and then I'll make some folks that will just struggle, and I'll make this class here. And if you ever hear doctrines like that that try to come up with a reason why, different people who struggle, just know that their message did not come from God. Because God had, uh, has one thing that's true about him, that he is no respecter of persons. Not at all. Before I dive into uh, this message, my name is Clarence Hill. I am a happily married husband of Alicia. We've been married almost 16 years now. And uh, sometimes when you hear stuff like that, it's the story world, and we never argued, and we have the perfect marriage, that's why I'm the one that does the family and the marriage classes. Well, my story's a little bit different. The reason we're in the family and marriage <coughs> the zone is because we know that it takes work. That's right. Someone asked me years ago, how did you come up with this concept for Eye to Eye, which is the name of our uh, organization? How did you come up with the concept of not just doing, you know, seminars where you're in a group kind of like this and you have one speaker and you have everybody looking at you. It's more of a small group. It's more of a circle. Couples getting together and building community together. Ten years of doing that, having creative events, having fun together, our children having fun together. Zero divorces in ten, ten years. Amen. Now, we weren't doing massive seminars, but lives were changed. And the difference of what, of what we were doing is we were working for the long term. We didn't just want to see couples 10, 15 years from now, and now they were separated. The unfortunate news was that there were some couples that it was obvious God was drawing them. But somehow they thought that since we were a marriage group, that meant that we were all both broke, busted, and disgusted of the term we used back in the day. <laughs> They thought that it was some type of uh, stain on your name if you belonged to a marriage group because that must mean you had problems and you didn't know how to fix things. Well, this was different. Uh, our group was a group of like-minded couples. The truth was that we, a lot of us were broke, busted, and disgusted. And, but there were some that had great marriages before they even came. But this is one secret I want to give to everyone in this room. Find people who are like-minded. Find people who, when you bring your children around, and they're around, they're not too needy to want to look past you and shake your son's hand and take that five minutes to tell him, you do know what you could do with your life, don't you? Hmm. You know that, don't you? Don't put any limits on God. You want men around your sons that are going to speak into those sons' lives. Amen. That's right. You want women around your sons who will dress modestly, 
and profile what a godly wife will be <coughs> around your sons and your daughters. That's right. And so if you want to know the secret of how to beat the war of the culture, start your own culture. Right. It is that simple. <coughs> we have the power to build our own subculture, and for a while the church had that, but somewhere along the way the church opened wide up, opened up wide, didn't know how to handle all of the false accusations that were coming at us, and we tried to embrace and embrace and embrace to the point where we began to not be able to know the difference between what Jesus meant when the Word of God meant when it said having common ground and calling someone friend or neighbor. You can have someone that's a friend in the world without being a friend of the world. So a friend is someone who I go to for intimate conversation. I'm struggling with this. I'm trying to figure out my path. I need to get some clarity on some things. That's a friend. And if you go to someone like that, be sure that they have the word of God inside of them, either near to the same degree you do or greater. But you don't take that conversation to someone who's in the world and they're lost themselves. And that's where the friend line, that friendship is based on us giving and loving and caring and meeting them on the common ground because they will go through things that are hard, we will go through things that are hard. That's common ground. So, God has given us one another, and the worst thing that you can do in your own life is miss the true friendships that God has given you. Be sure that God will give you the tools that it takes for you to have absolute success and cause you to thrive in your walk with God. You say, well, I don't see anyone around in my area that will encourage me in the Word of God. They won't, they, they, I don't know anybody who will challenge me. I don't know anybody who will correct me if I'm doing something wrong. I was with these guys, and they just let me fall into porn, and I was in it for months before anybody even asked. And all. Well, you know, you might have to pray. You might have to pray for a while. But get that group around you and get moving in that right direction. We had the privilege of doing this in eye to eye, and now for over 10 years, we've had the privilege of being divorce free, and uh, I'm just a, a happy servant to have been a part of it. We didn't do it on purpose. I wasn't smart enough and said, hey, we're going to start this group, and this is how we're going to do it. The reason I knew to do it was because I needed it. It's just that simple. Uh, I just I realized that one day we were sitting at the lake, there's a lake in a city called Lake Hefner. And my wife and I and my brother and his wife had gone to a family life weekend to remember. Has anybody been to, the, to those? Amen. Awesome. If you haven't been, try to sign up. Yes, <coughs> yes it's, worth, it's worth the uh, trip. It's worth the money. And so we had gone to a day session, and we ended up at Lake Hefner. And we're all sitting on a blanket, all four of us, and I just impre felt impressed with God. And, you know, we, my, I'm a bullet, and my wife's a bullet. So, I mean, that, that's going to be sparks, but... When we were getting married, we both told my parents, because she had seen fussing in her house, her parents were divorced, I'd seen a little bit in my house, and so we told them emphatically, we will never argue. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what they do right now. <laughs> and they enjoy reminding me of, of that statement. So, um, right there on that, uh, blanket sitting there at Lake Hefner. I turned to my uh, brother and to my sister-in-law and I said, uh, I just felt God wanted me to do it. I said, if my wife can't talk to me about something, I want you two to know that you have absolute liberty. She has absolute liberty to tell you without talking to me. Now this, this is of course, this is my brother. We trust each other. And God can give you other men like that. I have other men like that who are not my natural brothers. And I said, now, if, if she has a problem with me, then Lisa, I don't care if she tells you, because I trust that you will give godly counsel, and you will cause us to come together. Mm. Because the truth was, we had areas where she did not trust me, and conflict would arise quicker than I could even reach for the answer. Mm -hmm. And I just believe God wanted us to build a safety net through relationships. Don't lose your marriage over pride. Amen. Don't lose your spouse 
because you can't get past the conversation. I probably have the highest average of repentance per week than any man in this room. <laughs> if you saw my, you know, my sports card here, uh, I'm, I'm a chief at it. I'm getting to be a professional at um, going in there. And then I'm right. And of course, it's, it's worse when you, you love the Bible because then you're giving up scriptures when you're, when you're right about it, especially in the early days. And then after I give all those scriptures and I walk back to my room and I know something's still wrong, the minute I get quiet, the Holy Spirit tells me, you need to go apologize. <laughs> back in the room, because I would rather obey God than care what my wife thinks about me, um, whether she feels like she warned, pulled the argument or not, that, that's not most important. I want to please God. And I pray that that's your prayer, too. So... We wrote, wrote, wrote a book, I wrote a book called Beating the Odds, and it's out there on the table. It's uh, $10, and if you are in here and you're like, I'm strapped for money, or something like that, I'm sorry, I, I have a, I'm my board, I get on their nerves, because I do this all the time. If you don't have money, just let me know and take one, because we want to bless you. Um, but this, this book, I hope that you will, will take it on this point right here. Whenever you're called to something, God will give you special insight. It doesn't matter what it is. And this is the beautiful thing about walking with God. God will give you special insight. And this is a leading in to uh, the fact that you are called to be the man of the hour in the world that you're living in. You will receive special insight if you see God. What do I mean by special insight? I mean that if your family is in disarray, and we know that the family is the first calling of every man to be faithful over, we know that if we want to set men in the church and cause the church to thrive for generations, one of the first requirements of anyone who's a bishop or an elder, I just call it leadership principles, the first thing it says is that if you can't care for your household, how can you take care of the church? Right. So, now, and I, I do understand that we've gotten lax on that in, in, in the years, because that's a hard task. How many know that's true? Amen. When you say, uh, how can I force my wife to change? What can I do with this child? I got saved late. What am I supposed to do with my children? I will tell you, you this. There is hope for every single one of us. It's not just you. It's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're not smart enough to be a wise father. It's not because you just are always failing at something. You are living in a culture where it is set up for you to fail. Right. You are getting it from every single, you have got to understand that. You're getting it from every single angle. In fact, before you even get married, while you're in high school, while you're in junior high, while you're in elementary school, seeds are being sown in your heart and mind to cause you not to even be a marriable person. It's causing you not to even care about certain things that are natural to care about, to the point where if you have a person who is in their adult life and you ask them, what are they going to do with their lives? Very seldom will you hear someone even say, I can't wait till I have children. I ask you, so what do you want to do? What do you believe God's called you to do in your life? You hear vocation? You hear some hobby? You hear some dream, and how many times do you ever hear that part of that dream has anything to do with children? Mm. Why do I mention that? That's how effective the campaign has been against you. But with everything that God has shown me, everything that he's done in my life even to this day, nothing compares to my daughters who have now come up with their latest game. They run full speed and they jump from as far as they think they can and grab me, and they jump and grab me. Mid-air flying through the air, and sometimes I'm not worn at all, and I'm thinking one of these days we're all just going to be rolling in the floor. And I'm like, Lord, if I hurt myself, I just pray that I can grit my teeth and keep smiling at him because it's, you know, it's love and hurt, sweetheart, and I'm happy. One years old now, take it easy on me. But there's nothing greater. You young men who aren't married yet, you'll never know what it's like 
have your son and your daughters, and you open the door, and you hear voices in different parts of the house. Daddy's home! Mm. And all these feet start running for you. Bosses will never give that to you. Checks will never give that to you. Great ventures will never give that to you. A big buck will not give that to you. <laughs> <laughs> and almost daily, no matter what room I come in, they are looking for me to come in the door. I could end my session right now, but the fact that that's not even a thought in our minds, just I'm just saying that to tell you how much of a campaign to destroy the family you have been under. You are decades beyond decimated families. So normal, natural concepts, the Bible calls it natural affection. It's the loss of natural affection to where mothers can kill their own children. It's the loss of natural affection. The loss of natural affection is a, a man the joy of his life, and he's explaining stuff, and his children never are mentioned. That's a loss of natural affection. Right. A lot of times it comes through being scarred. So I'm, I, that's why I'm telling you this is a message of mercy today, because some of you have lost battles, and you know you feel cheated right now. You tried. You wanted to talk about it. You didn't want someone to come in and take it. And some of you are angry and bitter with your own ex-wives. But in the redemption of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to take up your cross again. Forgive her. And I'm going to give you some things today so that you can be the man of the hour. First, I want to tell you, just real quick, and then I'm going to get into this message. Um, this book right here was from Special Insight. When you have a war that's been against us like it has been, we need an answer from God. And I believe we received one of those answers, and that's why it's explained here from a proverb that says that there are three, yea, four things that are small, but they are exceedingly wise in proverbs. And the first one is the ant. It says that the ant prepares her food in the summertime. It says the coney which is a rock rabbit, looks like kind of a gerbil, and they live in the rocks on the sides of like cliffs, so where predators cannot get to them uh, quickly enough before they can get into the safety of the rocks. And it says the conies make their homes in the rocks, and it says the locust, or like the grasshopper, that fell on Egypt and devoured everything. These locusts, they are strong together, but they're weak by themselves. And it says the spiders, the fourth one, it says they live in king's palaces. This principle, when I started studying it, I said the principle behind this book, I could write about seven books. I could write a book that said how to take a weak nation and turn it and make it great. How to take a weak people group and make them great. And this one is centered on marriage because it's a principle that if you are the weaker, these are the principles of how to handle it. Are y'all ready for them? You can grab the book out there and get into all the details, but here they are. If you're the weaker, number one, be an ant. Y'all all know ants work hard, but it says prepare your food in the summer. Summer is the time of opportunity. Because you know that the winter's coming, and an ant knows that he's too small and too weak to get food in the winter. Don't wait for that ice-cold feeling in the bed with your spouse. Don't wait till it gets so bad that your marriage is going into a wintertime season. Now, I know everybody in here is not married, so if it's your, you have an issue with your dad, if you have an issue with someone in your family, don't wait till it gets so bad that there's a blizzard in your relationship. Because relationships are weak right now, so you have to take the ant principle, work when it's summertime, or take opportunity, and don't be lazy about it. So I encourage people, instead of just going on vacation, Go to a weekend seminar on marriage and split your time as vacation and as building your marriage. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You can go play if you want to. And the fewest group that we have that gets involved year-round with eye-to-eye are couples that have been married zero to three years. But right around three years,
those eyes open like we need to do something. But work, take opportunity. The next one is the coney. The coney makes their homes in the rocks. They didn't say they visit the rocks, but they make their homes in the rocks. The rocks are cold and uncomfortable, but they're safe. I had a friend, and he said, we go to this church. He said, now most of the people in the church, they all have white hair. <laughs> and he said, we're the only young couple in this church. He said, and we love it. We just had a baby, and now this baby has about 20 grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> this guy decided to go for life in the rocks because it's a seasonal thing. Someone who may have a stronger marriage may be involved in ministry and out there, but you have to know how much weight your marriage can take because God will give you a season of time for your marriage to be built strong. So you have to know what season it is. And if it's time to build your marriage and if you're constantly going round and round with issues, then you probably got too much weight on your marriage. And for where we are in our generation, typically we have more weight than we should be carrying because it's just difficult times. It takes us a little bit longer than it did in generations past. So make your home in the rocks. Who are the rocks? Rocks are those that are consistent. They have faithful uh, relationships. They've been married for a long time. And they are relationships that are steady. Other people will look at that church and call them boring, but you know that you're going to have a 30 or 40 year marriage just by letting them pour into you for a while. Sometimes the rocks are not excited but you'll thrive. Isn't that wisdom? Amen. It's not something that's going to be advertised on the billboard. Find boring church to attend. <laughs> <laughs> Find where as many, uh, I know King James called Hori Head. Find as many seniors that are there and go get around them. But when you look up as a grandparent and all of your grandchildren have whole marriages, and not one of them is divorced, separated, or has sex outside of marriage. I think you might have done something right. Amen. Amen. Third one, the locust. The locust or the grasshopper. This gives us wisdom because all of us have dreams. The Coney talks about how to handle that household. So when God gets ready to call you into the work of the ministry, birth that dream inside of your life. You're not constantly dealing with things that are trying to disqualify you from the call of God. How many know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it's the very call of God that frustrates couples and they, and they divide. Because they're, they're like, there's no way you're going to stop the one dream God has put in my heart. You're not going to, and they turn on each other. And they don't realize that they're out in the field before they're strong enough to handle the pressure. Or they didn't know the wisdom of the locust. The locust says that when you go out to do the work of business or ministry or how, however the kingdom of God is going to be manifested through you, when you go out there, don't go by yourself. Right. And typically, your friends from your coney season are usually the relationships that God sends you out with in your locust season. Does that make sense? Am I losing anybody? <clears throat> so that when you look in the scriptures you see something that's pretty cool. A lot of brothers did the ministry together, James and John. They were brothers. Sons of Thunder, Peter and Andrew, they were brothers. The top four disciples were brothers, and all four of them knew each other before they met Jesus. So they were, coney, they were conies together, and then they got to be locusts going out to do the work of God together. How could they go out with Jesus? Probably because they had some stability at home. Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Jesus and his natural brother James, his natural brother James, called him James the Lord's brother, ended up helping with the early church. So God uses families. Now do you understand why the family is under such attack? Because your enemy knows that if he gets you in this area, he's not just destroying you. He's destroying multiple things. <coughs> because God was bringing you all together for a purpose that you would change. Listen to me now. You could change nations. Amen. These principles that I'm telling you, all of these creatures are thriving to this day. Because they follow the principles 
of the weaker. They don't try to act like lions if they're not lions. The last one is the spider. He says the spider is in king's palaces. Now the spider's just, just cool. When you really get this one, I'm not talking about Spider-Man. I'm just talking about the original eight-legged creature himself, the spider. He's ugly. Nobody likes him. But we do stare sometimes. How many of you all have ever gone outside and seen a web and just like, how in the world? Have y'all talked to him? I talk to him sometimes. Like, <laughs> like, that is just, are y'all as amazed as I am? As, how did you do that? How did you cut? And then you see like one end of the web way over there, the other one way over here in this beautiful design. But as beautiful as that web is, after I get done standing in awe, I still tear it down and try to fix it. That's a paradox, but that so fits with a people group or a group like marriage and relationship and family who is the weaker right now. This is you in your marriage. We try to do acts of love to our spouse. We go to a seminar or a weekend like this, and you get ready to go home and love your wife. And the minute you show her that beautiful web of all that you learned, how everything's going to be different from now on, she smiles like, oh, that's sweet, that's wonderful. And one thing that triggers a thought from back in the day, just like you look at that spider, like, man, I got bit one time. <laughs> you know, you wind the web up and start jamming in that corner, because you know where he's hiding in there, you know. And you just go out, and, and, and in your relation, how many times have you, with all sincerity in your heart, were, you were ready to start a revival in your own home, and your wife just tore it down like nobody's business. Well, guess what the spider does that you probably didn't do? And that for three, two or three years after writing the thing myself, this proved that it came from God and not me, I was still struggling to do it. The spider does not go in the corner after you tear his web down and whine one bit. The spider already knows you don't like him. The spider puts it out there, makes it beautiful every single time it's going to be beautiful. And that's the way our acts of love have to be. And when it gets persecution and gets negative responses, you know what it's going to do the next day? Build another web. And when you tear that one down, you know what it's going to do? Build another web. And if you fuss with them too much in that spot, He's going to disappear for a little while, but if you don't kill him, you know where he's going to be? Somewhere else doing what? Build another web. How many of you have that perseverance in your families? That's the secret of the spider. Get the book. So now that I'm done with my introduction, <laughs> I have about half of my time uh, to share with you. Now, that, that was an insight. Now, so my calling has been to the restoration of marriage and family. So that's why I tell you when God gives you a calling, he will give you special insight on things to show you how the victory will be attained. And God wants the same thing for you. So beating the odds is one phase, but I want to share with you about the life of Mordecai. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul's prayer is for us to know his will. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but should I be able to ask you, do you know the will of God for your life? Should I be able to ask you, okay, now that you know kind of what the will of God is and you've got a ballpark area, you say, I know it's somewhere here, right? Because we don't always get all the details, right? But then Paul says, I don't want you just uh, to have his will. I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. So sometimes you have uh, exacts of what he, you know he's calling you to do, but then there are principles also that help you to understand his will. I gave you some principles earlier. I told you that if a man hasn't cared for his household, how can he lead the church? 
So the call of God is strong. It takes over your life. It takes over your bones. You think about it. You dream about it. But then you have to temper it by the pattern and the growth of the word. So that while you're having that drive to go save the world, you don't want to drive over your children's toes getting to it and lose your household in the process of saving the world. So there's an order to knowing the will of God. That's just principle. It's true for every person. Thank God for men who were able to do that. But every time that principle is violated, there is a cost. There's no way for us to get past it. Every time we ignore our households and try to go to the next phase and go without our families, there's a cost. So there's principles. So he says, understand, be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So he said, in knowing the will of God, he says, I want you to have spiritual wisdom and I want you to have understanding. So now, can I ask you, based on the will of God for your individual life, do you have spiritual understanding about it? If we were sitting across from the coffee table, how can we answer this question together? If you've got a brother right in this room, this is a good question to ask the next time you talk. Do you have spiritual understanding about the will of God for your life? Do you know why you are where you are? Do you understand your place? Do you understand why God made you the way he did? Because a lot of our walk with God is discovering why your desires have been bent in a certain direction for so long. But if you discover it God's way, it's always going to be beautiful. Always. So God will give you divine insight. And that leads me into the story of Mordecai. Mordecai is a man who achieved a level of greatness that most dream about and people make movies about. Mordecai was set up as the greatest second to the king in all of Persia. He was second to King Ahasuerus and he had taken this opportunity where all of the Jews were going to be killed. Esther goes before the king and she tells all of the Jews to fast for three days. She goes, she receives favor, and Mordecai is raised up also. Now, when I did this study, I almost my, personally, I would have named the book the book of Mordecai. And I'm going to show you why in a second. Because the things that Mordecai did, every single one of us can do. And that's why I'm telling you right now, you are the man of the hour. And I want to tie a rope, and it may just be a rope for some of you, it may feel like that, to your future to tell you, I don't think you have any idea how much God could use you in your life. I happen to believe that one person can be used mightily to transform things. I happen to believe that the devil knows it more than most Christians do. And works actively to get you to reduce yourself. If you are blaming yourself over a failed marriage or a failed relationship, I'm not saying to blame or not to blame. I'm just telling you that the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than your blaming or not blaming. Jesus Christ rising from the dead is the, most, is the greatest act of hope possible. So that in every single life in this room, it does not matter where you have come from up to this very day, this future that I'm talking about where God can use you is real. He, will use, he wants to use... How can I say, you know, you know why I'm having trouble getting past it? I want to look every single man in the room in the eye and tell you, he wants to use you. And you're in this room listening to a stranger because God called you in this room to get this message. There was nothing about Mordecai in his life or disposition that is any different, and I'll say this, than probably over half of you in this room believe probably most of what Mordecai believes about life. Love God. Love children. Be a faithful man. How many in here don't believe something like that? But what I found out is a lot of times our beliefs are not connected to our actions. And a lot of times we don't know how to get from today 
to tomorrow with what we believe. And a lot of times we don't believe that what we're doing has any effect on anything in the first place. Sometimes we look for the greatness of Mordecai, the day where the king takes his ring off and put it on, puts it on the finger of Mordecai, the day when the great things in all the world sees you in great glory. We've got to see the great glory of our now. I want you to see the platforms that are in front of you right now. Let me give you an example. There's a man, he has children from a previous marriage. Most of his children are from a previous marriage and broken relationships. He's married to another woman now. And he has children of his own. He's a godly man now. He loves the Lord. And he wants to do everything he can for his children and his household. Let me give you a Mordecai position on that one. The Mordecai position says, I will do everything in my strength to love the seed that has come from my body. I will do everything in my strength while I have breath to communicate to my children that you have a father who loves you. I will not cease praying for my children because as long as I know that you came from this DNA, you are my child and I will pray for you. That's the dedication of a Mordecai. But let me tell you the first secret of Mordecai's life. Something that probably most people don't realize, but Mordecai took in an orphan. Mordecai went down to DHS. <laughs> Mordecai took in a young girl whose father and mother were cut out of the scene. So that says a lot about Mordecai. Mordecai loved children. And I share with you already that you're in a culture now that says children are a nuisance. That children are to be tolerated, not celebrated. God says that they are his heritage. God says the fruit of the womb is his reward. He loves children. He says, let the children come to me, because when they started to bring them to Jesus, the disciples, because obviously the concept has been trying to get in for a long time, the disciples began to rebuke them. And Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. And then it says he laid hands on each one of them. Took the time to touch the child. Do you remember what I said? What do you want to do with your kids? Get them around other men who are going to speak into their lives. You don't have time for nonsense. And if you go around nonsense, no, you're going in ministry mode to love them and to give to them. But when your family is relaxing and just resting through the toil of life, you do need time to rest, right? Y'all know that, right? You do need time to just relax and throw your feet up, laugh, roll on the floor, have fun, go through things you like to do. But do that around men who, while you're rolling around on the ground, you're like, hey, kid, you know you could be, you're unstoppable. You know that, right? What's God called you to do? Oh, I'm thinking about doing this, but I don't know. Don't get me. I don't know because I've seen you. And if God can do this in your life, he can do that. 30 seconds and you just change that kid's life. To this day, I remember the man. And I, to this day, I haven't told him thank you. But I remember the man that made me confident in my shot playing basketball. When I first started playing ball, I shot the ball with two hands. But whenever I go in his backyard, he'd come out, come down his little deck, there's money, there's money, there's money. <laughs> Don't let him have the ball, he's going to hit it. And you know what I did? When I picked that ball up with two hands with the worst form, I'd be getting just hitting that thing left and right. Swole my ego, and I knew I was ready to just take the world over. <laughs> Because a father figure spoke to me. Love children. That's an easy one, isn't it? That's an easy one to say, wait a minute. How did I fall for that lie and stop loving children? How did I fall for the lie and just because my son is getting rebellious with me right now? Stop your son and say, look, I know you might be mad about some things. But you will be great. Just listen to me for a second. Don't take your affirmation away from them. Don't let Satan trick you. Don't take your confidence in that son away from him. 
Don't let things stir you up so bad and pull you out of your man of the hour platform that you have learned through Mordecai. <coughs> this is position number one, to love children, because there are promises connected to loving children. Can I share with you another secret? Genesis 18. Because when you have a calling, God gives you special insight. Here's another one. Genesis chapter 18 is the story of Abraham. Now, how many know that Abraham had promises, right? As theologians will argue, well, those promises don't apply to us. That was Old Testament, yada, yada, yada. I, I want to tell you, whenever you see God do something, you can act like Sherlock Holmes, Scooby-Doo, and Shaggy, too, and get this. <laughs> Learn it. Figure him out. Every time he manifested him, every time he spoke to anybody, you begin to learn what pleases him. And you know that he's no respecter of persons. So if he will favor Mordecai, he will favor me. And I'm telling you right now, some of y'all don't believe that, but it's the truth. If God favored Joseph, God will favor me. You got to say it. Okay, stained, can I explain to you what stained glass windows are? Stained glass window Christians. Uh, Christian, oh, Peter, he was just something else. Why do you think Peter was the leader of the church? Because his mistakes were all over the place, and he didn't run his life by his mistakes. He ran his life by his desire. And he opened the door wide for all of the people who have ten thumbs and two left feet trying to follow <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm a Peter. I can't tell you how many times I've failed in front of everybody in this organization. Over and over and over and over again. But the reason his glory could come was because he kept telling me, I told you to do it, didn't I? And stop worrying about what people were thinking. Then I look up after a decade of failing, a decade of trying to be excellent, working through the night, not sleeping, failing again to my own goals. Then all of a sudden we had zero divorces and we're like, how did that happen? God just wants you to put one foot in front of the other and recognize that you are called, you are called, you are called. Am I getting this point across to anybody in this room? Amen. God snatched you out. If I set you here and told you to begin to tell your stories in this room about how you came to Christ, about how your ears open. Did you know that if your ears are open to the gospel, that's a gift from heaven? There are, your own friends can't hear. That's right. Amen. Your own friends are making mistakes. Even in some of the mistakes that you made, right now you know deep in your heart, I made the mistake, but I can still see something. That's a gift. That's called the grace of God. And one day it, it, it trips inside of you where you recognize if God can keep me while I'm stumbling, what's going to happen if I start doing some stuff on purpose? <laughs> That's why Peter was the leader of the church. That's why God lets, tells Peter, now you guys are going to be standing from a, in front of kings and governors and rulers. Us, the, the, the fishermen crew? Now, now you know none of us were schooled by Gamilia or any of them guys, right? <laughs> You will stand in front of kings and rulers. Now let me give you another one. We have spent a lot of time at the church fussing with the government. But I'm telling you, the government can only manifest in darkness to the degree that the church is not standing up in the light. So we start fussing with the darkness, and I'm telling you it's because of men who don't know who they are. Because over and over and over again in the scriptures, when there was someone who was faithful to God, he raised them up. There is no power on earth that can stop God from putting you where, where you're called to be. I don't know if you believe me or not here, but I'm going to talk to the nine folks that might be listening right now. <laughs> but every single one of you are somewhere along this path of Mordecai, where you are called to be the man of the hour in your family, you know what? You might just be the man of the hour for one foster kid. You might be the man of the hour, and, and, and you've got to define your, your life right. And don't make the one mistake that a lot of people make. 
I tell you my thoughts up here so you won't be thinking I'm in some different category. You can't compare yourselves with others or you'll, you'll miss it. That's right. That's right. You're going to miss the mark really bad. 